1. The setup. My mother is not technically inclined. Fairly typical, I'd assume. She's not stupid, just not good with technology. Up to and including mechanical stuff. At least she's not my sister, who for some reason genuinely doesn't understand why you can't remove the middle block of a layer of a Jenga tower if one of the side blocks is already gone. For some reason, my mother had recently decided she wants to get into voice acting and voiceover work. Which again, okay. If that's how you want to spend your free time, go ahead. I came home one day, a good three months after she started doing voice auditions and the like, to find her and my younger brother, also not technically inclined, but not technically illiterate either, trying to troubleshoot something on her laptop. With a big microphone set up next to her, I was soon roped into trying to figure out the problem they were failing to troubleshoot, by merit of them being set up at the dining room table with an earshot of the entire house. The problem. It started with a Windows update. After the update, something in one of the programs she uses wasn't working. She followed a bunch of guides online and ended up uninstalling and reinstalling it. But no, it's still broken. There are two problems now. She can't click and drag on a specific part of the program, and no matter what she does, there's an echo in everything she records. The Complications I have absolutely no idea what she's been doing these last few months, why she uses the program she's using, what her workflow is supposed to look like, how it might have changed due to the reinstall, and how any of the programs, at least three of them, are supposed to work. Aside from having used Audacity 1 six years ago for her high school Spanish class homework. I'm good with computers and programming, but that's strictly on a putters around messing with things and learning at a random level along with some basic programming knowledge and the scientific method to back up my madness. And she can't give me any more details than this isn't supposed to zoom for the first problem, and it echoes for the second. I did ask about settings, how she initially installed the programs. Nothing. For the purposes of this troubleshooting session, she might as well have had someone else do all of that. She remembers nothing up to and including why she decided to use these programs in the first place. She can't really elaborate on what she did to uninstall and reinstall the programs either, or what the initial problems were that made her decide doing so was necessary. My brother is no help either, being in the same situation as I, but with a much shorter temper that has already been exhausted by the time of my arrival. He does tell me he's done the basic Google the symptoms and read what comes up step, which I know he's proficient at, so that at least streamlines my approach a little. So, not good. I'm going in almost completely blind. I experiment with the click-can't-drag problem first, and yes, she's right. Clicking on the waveform just zooms in. No variation on the act of clicking produces anything, Besides the zoom and drop-down menu with no relevant options, there are, of course, dozens of different settings up on the program's top bar that could be doing this. So I look for anything involving zoom. Find the basic zoom in and out buttons. Using those doesn't reset it to her expected behavior. While I'm at it, I have her demonstrate the other problem. Sure enough, in her voice recording there's a slight but noticeable echo. These problems are indeed problems, which at least rules out some form of negative placebo effect. That damn update broke something. I'm pretty sure from my vague memories that the click should be doing something other than zooming, and echoes are bad. I fiddle around a bit, at a loss, but feel certain that the click problem has to be something simple. It's almost certainly a setting somewhere. In the meantime, I feel my mother is sometimes helpful, but usually not assertions. No, I'm pretty sure the Windows Update didn't remove that feature from Audacity. That's not really how Windows Update works. I don't think the update physically altered your microphone either, but it might have messed with a driver or something. With my own only barely informed opinion... Bingo, there's a tiny button tucked away in a corner with some variation of alternate mouse function. 
as the hover text. Set it to click instead of zoom in the dropdown, and one problem has been solved. My mother professes to have never seen that button before in her life, so even odds that she clicked it versus third-party intervention somewhere in her mess of mindlessly following YouTube tutorials to reinstall. But this was all just the easier of the two issues. Now we have to deal with the echo, and I'm dreading it. The final result echoes in an intimidating problem when I barely understand what the programs involved do. She introduces me to her two other audio programs, and I ask her what she usually does. Her workflow seems to involve recording something in Audacity, then editing it on the fly with both Audacity and another program. Then there's a third program that's involved somewhere afterwards. All of this is done with the process of someone who treats every function of a program as its own black box, and has learned how to get what she wants by performing the same arcane ritual each time through trial and error. So again, she's no help. It's genuinely impressive to me that she's gotten this far with no in-person assistance and minimal understanding of anything she works with. But that's a small comfort now. When the system breaks down and she can't tell me anything about why, where, or how it might be going wrong. Too many programs. Too many steps, but how is she listening to the final result right now? By replaying it in Audacity, before any of the other programs come into play. It already has the echo. I breathe a huge sigh of relief at that information. Next up is reproducing the problem. The recording we've been looking at this whole time was made after the problem started, of course. But I get her to go through the process of making a new one right now anyway. To watch for obvious red flags. She sits down, adjusts the microphone to point towards her, hits record, speaks. As she speaks a half second or so behind, the laptop starts playing the sound through its external speakers at a decent volume. I assume that's my fault. We were just listening to the older recording. Have her stop, mute the laptop. Why did you do that? What do you mean? It was still playing sound. It always does that. Uh... To be clear, whenever you record, the laptop plays it back while you're still recording, out loud, not in your earphones or anything? Yes. Are you sure this echo is a new problem? Yes. But... I try to explain what I'm thinking with the appropriate pointing to illustrate my thought process. You make sound, sound go in microphone, microphone sends to computer, sound come out of computer, sound from computer go in microphone, microphone sends to computer. This makes an echo, right? No. No? No. Okay, maybe the microphone is set up to avoid this obvious problem. I genuinely don't know if that's possible or what was happening for her prior to today. All I see is a microphone with one of those spit guard things right next to both her face and a computer putting out audible sound. I'd like to just take her word for it. Actually, on second thought, I would prefer if she was wrong because that would be a hell of a lot easier to fix than some other unknown problem. Regardless, we need to test this. I mute the computer and cajole her into making another recording, despite that not being how she does it. She records with the laptop silent. We unmute the laptop and listen. After she's done. No echo. Mom, you're supposed to mute the laptop when you record. But I never did that before. I'm pretty sure you should have, but she looks at the computer. But that's such a hassle. I demonstrate the button combination that mutes the computer. It's two buttons, like this. See? Easy. I don't want to do that. Uh, sorry? You have to. Think of it as a workaround. That does it, thankfully. She thanks me, and takes her laptop and microphone back to her room, leaving me to wonder if I actually found the problem. What the update and reinstall actually did, if anything, and whether it might have been prudent to burn down her program pile and teach her something simpler before the current mess comes back to bite me some other day. The next day, she tells me that I fixed a problem that's plagued her from day one, a sneaky background echo and everything she recorded, one she never saw fit to mention before this moment. 
even though I directly asked her. Oh, and also, do I know how to split an MP3 file into several separate tracks in the file itself? My mother is a wonderful woman, but she is solely responsible for me knowing from experience exactly why I hate providing technical support. Two, this story takes place approximately 11 years ago, in 2012, on the island of Oahu. We will also witness the arrival of Emperor Mong the Magnificent. Think of him as the Chinese cousin to that Irish bastard Murphy. Murphy causes bad things to happen. Mong is the one who gives you suggestions of what could be brilliance. Save that if Murphy gets his way, you're going to end up with a fucking mess all over creation. At the time, I was working in an office environment alongside three dozen other people. We had three printers. Number one handled special assignments and sexy paper. It was kept under lock and key and turned off unless needed. Number two was for a clerk to use for official documentation. It never left his desk and was only detectable by a few nearby desktops. Number three was a large multi-function printer by Canon in the main common area of the office. Number three processed approximately 97.8 of all print jobs in the office. Now, when I first began working there, it was understood that the MFP needed to be respected and treated accordingly. If your section needed printing to happen, you loaded it with paper and away you go. If the print job was truly spectacular, you were normally told to go pay for proper professionals because MFP had limits. Along came John Doe. John Doe didn't care about the rules or courtesy. His section head, Cactus Butt, supported him in this. Cactus Butt thought fucking over everybody else in the office was A-OK -okay because neither his nor John Doe's shit stank. On a fine summer day, John Doe decided he needed a whole bunch of copies. Not just a piss load, oh no, he needed a metric fuckton printed at once. At this moment, Emperor Mong the Magnificent appeared in a flash of purple smoke. What are you waiting for, my son? Ah, this printing vexes me, almighty one. Just get it printing already, nobody will mind. Go home for lunch, grab a beer. By the time you get back from shagging your wife's asshole and chugging a six-pack, it'll all be done. You know... You're a genius, your royal mongness. Without further delay, John Doe does his print. No warning, no courtesy given. Just load it up, print queue, and away he goes. Several thousand double-sided collated pages. No, I'm not really exaggerating about this. It was midsummer. Outside air temp is 90 and humid. It's Oahu. And this is an old building with no AC, so all the windows are open. We are within one mile of the ocean. Salt is in the air, lots of it. Printer 3 has not received any form of service or love from a technician in a long time. Our first clue came when the MFP stopped responding to print jobs, as in not receiving them. This is odd, I get sent to investigate. Turn it off, disconnect power. The machine is hot, outrageously hot. I can smell something burning. Continue troubleshooting, but it's entirely non-responsive, and the burning smell is coming from deep within the unit. We have gone from snafu to tarfu, and fubar is in sight. Fack. Hey, Mr. Supervisor, this machine is not going to be doing anything. I grabbed the numbers for tech support and its serials. You want me to call, or would you like to do the honors? Gimme. I got a bad feeling about this. One eternity later, the maintenance tech arrived three hours later. Everybody is standing around drinking coffee and waiting for him to fix this rather necessary piece of equipment. We watch as he gets elbow deep in the MFP, then comes out with what should have been a green circuit board with the motherboard on it, except everything was melted and charred. Bohica. Whoever had a major print job on here and managed to overheat, then melt the motherboard. We do not have a motherboard for the six-year-old model on island. It will have to be shipped out from the factory. How long, the boss asks. 
Today is Thursday. They won't get here till Monday afternoon at a minimum. Do it. Who had the big print job? John Doe responds, Emperor Mong said it was fine. It was the PowerPoint slides for the report my section is giving tomorrow. Wasn't that over 300 slides long? Yes, I wanted everybody to have a copy of all the slides on paper. Which I told you not to do, given we're planning for roughly 100 people to be in attendance. But your section's budget just bought our new motherboard. John Doe and Cactus Butt remained in Duranceville for the remainder of the time I worked in that office. They were required to get permission to print anything for the next year in writing. Once the new parts arrived, the tech performed a much needed maintenance, cleaned the whole system, and made it work like new. We thanked him, paid him, and sent him on his way. Moral of the story, for most jobs an office MFP can handle the matter, but when you're talking thousands of pages at once, you're better off going to a pro shop. They have much more capable machines, and it will be cheaper to have them handle the print job than it will be for you to buy a new motherboard. Three, the backstory. Myself and a buddy started up a small student-run help desk while we were both still in high school that eventually blew up to the 800-plus person workforce we have today. All of us in departments are 100% volunteer and do it just for fun or just to keep our minds sharp, as we're all either broke high school students or on disability. Given that our entire operation is as laid back as it is, Corporate policy isn't as big a deal as it might be in a large corporate center for the likes of Comcast, AT&T, etc. Even though this place is pretty laid back, there are some things we just won't tolerate. This story is of one of those times where following policy actually helped the customer. It's kind of nice to know that our CRM software, Microsoft Dynamics CRM 4.0, Yes, we're that much of a shoestring budget operation, has been customized as follows. 1. Accounts, called jackets, are groups of one or more people. Example, a business, a family, etc. Example, the Smith family. And that's where the security question and PIN are. 2. The contracts, or cards, are the individual people. Example, Mr. John Smith. Each one of these areas has a tab called Alerts and Warnings or something similar, which is for those things we don't want or cannot afford to get lost in the normal notes, as each time you add a note it pushes the previous ones down, so trying to find a disability alert that was placed 120 phone calls ago is near impossible unless it's in the alerts. The whole thing happened about seven or so years ago, so my memory might be a bit fuzzy on events. Everything was calm. I had just gotten back from lunch and handled a few tickets for simple things. Password resets, homepage changes, etc. And finally my phone rings. Thanks for calling, my name's Lindsay. Can I start by getting your first and last name, a good callback phone number, and a brief description of the problem? The customer gives me the required information. It turns out she needed help converting a Word doc to a PDF and sending it to her teacher for school. I look her up in the CRM and begin to troubleshoot the issue when in the background I hear a man who is clearly angry yelling at my customer. She tries to convince the man that she's working with tech support to get help for a project for school, ready to be turned in, and if she doesn't do so before class tomorrow morning, that her grade in some class will slip down below an A. I hear shouting and crying in what sounds like a not-so-nice situation on the other end of the phone, so I immediately message my boss with what's going on, and she tells me to message head of security. That conversation goes as follows. Do you have a minute? I got this crazy call, I explained the situation, and I've already let the boss know what's up. Lindsay, yeah, I've got some time, let me look into it. While I'm doing so, keep the line open just in case she comes back to wrap up the case. My boss chimes in. On next contact, if the situation calms down, have her make an encrypted Word doc, OneNote file, something, and have her submit the password to that file via ticket, 
and encourage her to journal things. If something goes really bad, she needs to give information to the police or someone similar. They can call here and get that individual password if she's in an unsafe situation to give it to them. I know this is something we don't normally do, and I know we don't play Password Vault for customers, but this seems serious. I'm down to help when I can. Just keep me posted. Eventually, the yelling stops and the customer returns to the phone, and we finish up the original mission, and I walk her through what my boss KM told me to have her do. She does it, and we work towards call closure, and I do my notes explaining the situation in the CRM. A few weeks go by, and I get a call from EB, of all people, the yelling jerk from earlier. He had decided to root through CX's laptop while she was at school and came across one of several copies of the journal file, and decided to call us and try to open it. And that call goes like this. I get the standard greeting. He gives me the original information and explains the locked file. Sir, I see there is a profile under that name, but I'm going to need both the security answer and PIN to go further into this account. He gets the security question and PIN. I look under the contact section of the account and I ask for his name. Shocker, it's not there. I'm sorry, sir, but unfortunately, even though you've successfully verified the account's security information, I'm not able to help you because your name is not on the account, and the only person listed there is Emily. You'll need to have her call us back to add you as an authorized user or create your own account. They're free. But that won't give you access to this person's account in any way unless she adds you. He goes on a verbally abusive rant about how we don't keep secrets in this family and how he's going to have my job and how he wants his supervisor right ducking now, now, now. I gladly inform him that I will be getting him in touch with my CEO, who's going to tell him the same thing. I also explain that one, we don't store customer passwords of any kind in their profile for security reasons, thus we don't have it. I threw my teeth on that one. And two, even if we did store user passwords, I couldn't disclose them without him being on the account. I ask him if he still wants my supervisor. What about now isn't registering? And he uses some racial slurs. I'm white, by the way. Sir, I must advise that if you're not going to keep the call at a professional level, I will be forced to terminate the call as such. Please refrain from using that kind of language when speaking to me. For those wondering why I didn't warn him sooner, it is because I knew it wouldn't have helped us, plus I couldn't get a word in edgewise. During the whole thing, I decided to send IMs to my boss and security, letting them know who I was dealing with and what was happening, and asking if the boss was ready to take the call. She uses an iPad to communicate, so she prefers that if there's going to be a transfer, or even just calling her, that we check to make sure she's ready and available. She acknowledges that she's ready and I proceed with the transfer. Let's just say it went as well as one might expect given the nature of the situation, how this guy was acting towards me, and the boss's use of an iPad for communication. After transfer, I write up my notes and send a quick email to the customer advising that there's a crap storm brewing at home, and to be ready for fun times. She eventually responds, asking for the call recordings and my notes from the interactions, if they're available, so she can pass them to a mandatory reporter. Think teacher, counselor, etc. Normally, we don't give copies of phone recordings, agent notes, or other CRM data to customers, but given the situation, the boss provided the release, but to make damn sure that 1. It's the customer accessing it, and 2. It successfully gets to mandated reporter. To accomplish step one, I personally handed this stuff over to her on the flash drive at a McDonald's over lunch, and to accomplish number two, I asked that she send me an email confirming that it's in the hands of the mandatory reporter. Well, fast forward about three weeks and I'm dealing with my tickets, and I open up her profile. As she had an unrelated ticket, I needed to pull up vendor information for one of her devices from, and right when I open up the account, I see this information under the Alerts and Warnings tab. Think of it like a giant employee notepad for critical things like disability accommodates, abusive customer warnings, or other special handling instructions and modifications to processes. 
Per security, this customer lives in a not so good environment with a man named, and then it gives his name. He is known to make threats to staff. Should he call in, do not release any information about this account or customer status under any circumstances. Should he call in, either one, transfer him to the boss as soon as possible, or if that fails, immediately disconnect and don't entertain the call. Be sure to log the call and one, alert security, and two, send a follow-up to the customer via ticket so she knows to be ready for an impending crap storm. Along with management. This customer has been keeping an electronic diary regarding the aforementioned issues. Should a verified law enforcement officer, social worker, or similar call asking for information. The password is, and then it gives the password. And now the ending of the tale. Last I heard from that customer, she was doing much better. As for him, he still calls in and causes problems for staff, including myself and colleagues, including the boss. But we deal with him accordingly. Security actually told him on one call in particular, Sir, good luck getting us shut down or having our jobs. We're all 100% volunteer, and so you won't be hurting us financially at all. I got more positive stories from that place, but that's for another day. I just thought I'd share this one as I think it would fit the definition of that one wild story that they should make a documentary out of. 4. For context, I work in a little smartphone repair shop where our sole mission is fixing hardware issues, no tech wizardry here. My role, however, doesn't involve wielding a soldering iron. It's more playing the charming face of the shop and juggling office tasks. With just a trickle of customers strolling in daily, the job is usually stress-free. <laughs> well, most of the time. But among the ordinary tales of broken screens and cracked cases, there's one that truly stands out. One day, an elderly gentleman walked into our shop. Concern written all over his face. He explained that he couldn't hear a word when he talked on his phone. Convinced that the microphone was to blame, I simply corrected him, suggesting it might be the speakers that were misbehaving. So I inspected the speakers, but lo and behold, the built-in diagnostic tool on the phone decided to not work. So I just give him a call. I dialed away and... No sound. Though no problem. With a smile, I assured the customer that we could fix it swiftly. All we needed was a speaker replacement. He asked about the cost and time to fix, and I told him 70 schmeckles. Not actual currency. And two hours for the job. The deal struck. He entrusted his phone to me. Since it was a relatively quick fix, he'd be back to reclaim his phone the very same day. As the two hours passed, our elderly friend returned to collect his phone, eager to confirm its renewed health. I retrieved it for him, and he posed the quintessential question. Does it work properly now? Truth be told, I hadn't personally performed the repair, but I assumed our technician had given it a thorough test. Nevertheless, he needed reassurance, so he requested that we make a real phone call together to put it to the test. I complied, dialing his number, and the phone rang for a while. I ended the call, confident that the speakers were back in tune, as indicated by the melody. Yet the man remained unconvinced he wanted to hear it in an actual conversation. I obliged, handing him the phone, and we connected. To his delight, it worked. Satisfied, he settled the bill, wished me a pleasant evening, and made his exit. I reclined in my chair, replaying the exchange in my mind, just another day at the office, or so I thought. However, no more than ten minutes later, our shop phone rang. I answered. Phone repairing company, good evening. How can I assist you? The voice on the other end responded. You called me ten minutes ago. What's the matter? I was bewildered. The company phone had been in my possession the entire time, and I hadn't made any calls. It was the same gentleman from our store, now on the other end of the line. I explained that he'd been in our shop only a short while ago, and he chuckled, apologized, and promptly hung up. The day took an unexpected comedic twist, and my co-workers and I shared the heartiest laugh we'd had in quite some time. 5. 
I left my previous employer, PE, about six months ago. Before I left, they had a contract to support three service lines with Company A. Company A got bought out by Company B a couple of years before I left. Both companies are multi-billion dollar corporations. After the merger, Company B left Company A's support contracts alone for a couple of years. But shortly before I left, they put all of them out to bid. PE only received a new contract for one of the three service lines that they previously supported, and it was a much reduced scope contract at that. I worked for PE for six years before leaving, and during that entire time, we consistently told Company A that they really needed to upgrade one of the service lines we supported. It was still running on server 2008, not R2, and Windows XP. However, they never wanted to spend the money to upgrade it. A few months before I left, the SQL server supporting this application had a drive failure and, despite being RAID 5, the entire array corrupted once a new disk was installed, and the server became useless as no one had the software to do a reinstall. I was able to get everything hobbling along on the app server with a version of SQL Express, but we insisted they had to upgrade. A couple of weeks later our support contract for that system ended, and it was turned over to another company. However, the new company did not have any technical staff. During the transition, I sent them a CSV file from another database so they could use it for historical reporting, but they couldn't figure out how to open it. So while I was still with PE, I had to continue supporting this ancient pile of garbage and pray it didn't crash. A project was started to migrate Company A's system to Company B's system, and I had a number of meetings with another third party on how everything worked. However, no migration happened before I left, but it seemed like they had everything they needed. Obviously, I washed my hands of this when I left PE. On to last week when I'm enjoying vacation. I get a text message from the project manager for PE, asking if I knew how the third party could remote in to get information off of the old server so they could plan how to migrate it six months later, and apparently they still have not managed the migration that was well underway before I left, and apparently they're starting over. I responded with that it was not my problem, and Company B has their own IT people who should deal with it. And besides, there is no way to remotely access it that I am aware of due to the age. PM kinda laughed at the fact that Company B's IT people would get involved in this, and said she was in charge of migrating it. This being despite the fact that PE is not getting paid to support this at all, and a different company is. PM then told me she was told I was available to answer questions, to which I responded that after six months, I felt that time was up, and while I might answer questions for PE itself, I would not be answering them for Company B. I ended the conversation by saying I was on vacation, and any further assistance would have to wait until I had returned from vacation and I had a signed contract in hand for support. I sent all of the text messages to my friend, who took my job at PE, and he told me that he was the only one that was ever supposed to contact me for anything. He said he was going to run it up the chain there to make sure it doesn't happen again. This system was such a nightmare for me, that despite loving my new job and being on vacation, this short text exchange actually caused me stress just thinking about that system. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Terrific Tales of Technology, episode 31. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Please interface with the like button before you leave, thank you kindly. And if you'd like to get the videos a little bit earlier, I know I'm still saying that. You can support me on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month, which is linked in the description. You'll also find a link to the Hellfreezer merchandise store, where you can get yourself some shiny new Hellfreezer merchandise. It is coming up to Christmas, so keep that in mind for loved ones. If they're Hellfreezer fans, it'd be weird if you got them Hellfreezer merch and they weren't a Hellfreezer fan. And you can also make donations during streams and videos like this one. And while you don't have to do this, and you never have to do this, I very much appreciate it, and it's been helping me out a lot. 
Okay, let's see. Do, do, do. Nope, no other business today. So let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... What is something you really want, but you're not going to buy it because you know you don't need it? Right now, I think for me, it is uh, the shiny new 4090 graphics cards that are out there. They're offensively expensive. I have no practical need for it, although it would boost my system overall. But my current graphics card, which is a 2070, literally does everything I need it to do including running some like AI programs for generating the images for these videos. I look forward to reading some of yours in a comment below. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. It's time for food. I've been recording for a while. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves. <laughs>